Well, welcome everybody to the 2023 MLT Aiken St. Paul's College University Affiliation Lecture. I think it's probably also the 2022-2021 MLT Aiken St. Paul's College University Affiliation Lecture. And it's fantastic to be here in person. I know there's some people, many people, in fact, who have zoomed in or teamed in and um, all I can say is you're missing out on an opportunity to have a real in-person event, uh, but we're very glad to have you anyway. I'm Jonathan Croft, and I'm a member of the board of the directors of the Morrow Institute of Peace and Justice, and I'm also a lawyer at the law firm MLT Aikens LLP, which is the sponsor of this annual lecture. Uh, we uh, are a law firm that has offices all across Western Canada, and that's my plug for my firm. And this is also my plug for the Institute. In accordance with our tradition, um, we begin our event tonight by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of the uh, Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and also on the homeland of the Metis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with uh, our Indigenous uh, friends and communities in the spirit of reconciliation and in the spirit of collaboration. I Just a few housekeeping notes before we begin our main event. Uh, this uh, event is, uh, of course, a public lecture, and it's being recorded, and it will be uh, published or broadcast on the Morrow Institute's YouTube channel once the technicians do their magic. I don't know how long that takes, uh, but it will be there. And this annual lecture recognizes the connection uh, between MLT Aikens, the law firm, and the Morrow Institute. Um, MLT Aikens, as I told you, was a Western Canadian law firm and the founder of the Morrow Institute, Art Morrow, was a lawyer uh, who uh, was at the firm. I worked with him and he, of course, founded this institution. And when he did, uh, we made as a firm a founding gift to establish this lecture. And our hope is that it's going to continue to be a Forum for dialogue and collaboration amongst students, the faculty at the university, the Winnipeg community, and other universities around the world. When we uh, hold this lecture each year, we uh, always hope that our visiting lecturer will be able to come and uh, spend a few days in Winnipeg, meet our graduate students, meet the faculty, and uh, interact with some of our community organizations. Our guest this year, Dr. Marsubian, uh, has told me before the event that he's uh, already attended a Peace and Conflict Study student colloquium at uh, Colloquium. He has also taken the opportunity to visit the Freeman Family Foundation Holocaust Education Center and also our Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And he, he attended those institutions together with some of our graduate students. So this is a perfect example of what we wanted to facilitate. And we're very grateful uh, to Dr. Marcinian for coming and for doing these things. This is, of course, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Week. And today is also the 80th uh, anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So it's particularly an appropriate time for us to have the opportunity to learn from Dr. Masubian, who has such expertise uh, in, in the field of genocide studies and, and uh, the grim history of how that's affected our world. I'd like to call upon uh, Dr. Christopher Adams, uh, who is the rector of St. Paul's College. He's also the chair of the board of directors of the Morrow Institute of Peace and Justice. He's also my high school buddy, and he's going to bring greetings on behalf of St. Paul's College. Where did he go? Oh, there he is.
Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, that's great. You know, my, our, our sort of past of Calvin High School coming out there. So, uh, but I, I do want to welcome Dr. Armin Marsubian. It's uh, it's great to have you here in person. Uh, uh, you know, our St. Paul's College, we're coming up to our 100th anniversary. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, there was a view that our college needs to do more in terms of community outreach and be relevant. And the two things that were created in the late 1990s was the Jesuit Center for Catholic Studies. And the other thing was the Arthur, Morrow v, the Arthur v. Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College. Uh, the Morrow Institute is a diversified center. It's got a board of directors that always ensures there's an equal voice of Muslims, Jews, and Christians. Sometimes we're short of Christians and the lions are hungry, but anyway, we try to have a diverse group around that board and also indigenous voices. So um, it's side of the, the Morrow Institute doing great things in the PACT, the Peace and Conflict Studies Program under Adam Muller's uh, direction. It's a great thing to have Dr. Masubian here as just an indication of the type of things coming. So, so thank you very much for coming here. Uh, Dr. Zainaletvia, I think it's you're up next. And, uh, but thank you everybody for coming here and thank goodness the Jets were in playing tonight. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce the guest lecturer tonight, Dr. Arlen T. Marsubian. Um, and uh, he is a professor of philosophy at Southern Connecticut State University and is affiliated uh, faculty member with the Institute on Human Rights at the University of Connecticut and a visiting scholar at Columbia University. He is editor-in-chief of the journal Metaphilosophy and serves as first vice president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. Dr. Marsubi in his lecture published extensively on topics in moral philosophy, American philosophy, genocide studies, human rights, aesthetics, Armenian photography, and cinema. He has taught courses on human rights, genocide, and Holocaust studies, as well as the Armenian and genocide. Including, uh, uh, including courses on literary and artistic responses to mass atrocity. He has co-edited seven books, and, uh, and, and including Genocide's Aftermath, The Responsibility and Repair. His book, Fragments of a Lost Homeland, Remembering Armenia, is based upon extensive research about his family, the Dildilians, who were accomplished Ottoman Armenian photographers. And he has organized exhibitions of Dildilian photography in Turkey, Armenia, Great Britain, Greece, and the United States. Upcoming exhibitions will take place in Thessaloniki, Greece, and Valence, France. His companion volume to the exhibitions, Reimagining a Lost Armenian Home, the Dildilian Photography Collection, was published in both English and Turkish. He has received a national endowment for the Humanities and Mellon Foundation Fellowship for this year to develop a, digi a virtual digital version of the exhibition. And he has worked closely with NGOs in Turkey that focus on the treatment of minorities and accountability for the Armenian genocide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marsubian. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Um, I would like, um, and it was a warm introduction, not just now, but ever since I, oops, <laughs> ever since I got here, um, despite the cold weather, I left spring and returned to, to uh, winter, but uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. It makes us appreciate uh, that uh, the world is diverse. Um, and as was pointed out, I had great opportunities to meet the students in the Peace and Conflict Studies, and that was a pleasure. I always love working with students. Um, and uh, I've been doing some of that, even though I'm on a fellowship lead this year, but I've, uh, I, I always like to be in, in the back in the classroom. I also like to thank uh, Jason Brennan, who has been 
organizing my visit here. He's done an amazing job. Um, and uh, he's a gem of a coordinator. And my my friend Adam Miller, who's uh, welcomed me here, uh, who I know from my work in genocide studies. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Adam's family, Emily and his two charming, their two charming daughters who made me feel at home at their house. Um, I am I am going to be speaking. First, I'm going to be reading some of my paper, and then halfway through, I'm going to be just talking uh, along with many of the slides that I'm, I'm going to show you. Uh, so let, let me begin. The, the talk I'm going to give is going to be in, in three parts. Uh, the first part, I will touch upon two central issues uh, that are global challenges that Armenia is facing today. The issues I raise can, can be generalized to other conflict zones where longstanding ethnic and geopolitical issues continue to fuel violence. In the second part of my presentation, I will focus on Armenian genocide denial and how it has taken a new form in the current conflict with Azerbaijan. This is a somewhat unique form of denialism and is connected with the points I raised in the first, to first part of my talk. And finally, in the third part, where I won't be reading from my prepared text, I will briefly touch upon efforts to push back against genocide denialism. So let me let me move to the first point that I, I have this quote that I thought was very appropriate. And it's very appropriate because I'm actually quoting from an Azerbaijani author, not an Armenian author, who's voting from a Russian Nobel Prize winner. Uh, in which he says, as Solzhenitsyn has said, violence and lies, these two things have always gone hand in hand. Violence does not exist and cannot exist by itself alone. It is unfailingly accompanied by lies. Violence has nothing to hide behind except lies. And this is, in a way, the theme of denialism that I will be exploring. Now, I usually, in my talks, uh, save this to the end, but I'm going to save it to the beginning because I worry that by the end, we're running out of time and we're, we're rushing along. I, I, I've been dedicating, <clears throat> dedicating all my talks, unfortunately, for the last four and a half years to my good friend, Osman Kabbalah, who is a uh, human rights, and civil society leader in the Republic of Turkey, who has been in prison unfairly, unjustly for the last 40, four and a half years. Uh, he is someone who, without his guidance early on, I would have never had the first of four exhibitions that I had in Turkey, in many ways, groundbreaking exhibitions uh, without Osman and his support and the team of people I've worked with in Turkey and NGOs that I've worked with in Turkey. Um, he has been, uh, as I said, in prison for four and a half years and despite rulings by the European Court of Human Rights for his release, Turkish government under President Erdogan refuses to release it. And I'm hopeful that on May 14th in the next election in Turkey, things will change. And if President Erdogan loses that election, things will change. We can only hope. So let me let me go to the uh, oh, and I put this up because this I was reminded yesterday uh, when we had the seminar with the graduate students, many of them were talking about places that we're unfamiliar with, and I wanted to give you. Uh, a map to show you where we're uh, 
where my talk is focused. I mean, I'm sure everyone here knows where 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 Turkey is, um, and some of you might know where Armenia is and where Azerbaijan is, but the region of Nagorno-Karabakh here is where the conflict in particular is, is taking place, but all along the border region. And I will also have more to say about this region called Nakichabam. So these are the three parts of my talk, as I mentioned, and I'll, I'll start by uh, reading why history matters when assessing the risk of genocide. So as I said, I'm going to begin with the challenges facing Armenia today. Of course, there are many, but two will have to be my focus. The first issue arises from the woeful lack of historical knowledge, especially in the West, about the origins of the violence and cultural destruction perpetrated against Armenians in the Caucasus. The second shortcoming is a lack of appreciation of the essential link between cultural destruction and the threat that this poses to the very existence of the Armenian people. While some theoreticians uh, distinguish the crime of cultural genocide from the crime of genocide per se, I do not maintain this distinction. Cultural destruction is a central component of the harm of genocide and the acts proscribed by the Genocide Convention. One of the major historical misunderstandings of the Armenian genocide is the belief that the genocide ended with the defeat of the Ottomans, the Ottoman Turks, in October 1918. Surveys of historical literature find that for many years, the genocide was dated as occurring over the period 1915 to 1918. Even today, it is not unusual to see these dates referenced. I argue that this mischaracterization has had a detrimental, has had detrimental effects that carry forward to the present, to present Armenians and to their allies, to the present Armenians and their allies may, uh, may they carry over to the present, sorry. Uh, and, and Armenians and their allies may also be, may have contributed to this, this misunderstanding. And this is because during the decades long attempt to gain recognition of the genocide, they often highlighted the dates 1915, and I'm sure you've heard that again and again, 1915, we had the 100th anniversary of the genocide in 1915. But one only needs to, to think again of the posters, uh, the placards, the demonstrations, the films, the editorials that use 1915 as a shorthand for the genocide. Prominence has often been given to the early stages of the violence. This may be understandable because the greatest number of deaths occurred between the period 1915 and the fall of 1916. The emphasis here has been upon the killing, that is the biological destruction. This limitation is what I will challenge in the course of my talk. If one studies the history of this period, we know that the genocide actually began in 1914 and encompassed not just the Armenians, but the Christian minorities of the Ottoman Empire, including the Pontic and Aegean Greeks and the Assyrians. The violence did not end with the Mudros armistice in October 1918. They continued into the early 1920s and took other forms in the hundred years that have followed. While today the scholarly consensus among historians places the end point of the genocide as 1923, I will argue that the genocide continues to this very day in unique ways. The date 1923 
coincides with the establishment of the Turkish Republic and the Treaty of Lausanne, which codified the Turkish nationalist territorial gains of the historic Armenian lands. The catastrophic consequences of this treaty and its betrayal are further compounded by the fact that part eight of that treaty granted amnesty to the perpetrators of the Armenian genocide, some of whom had already been convicted in Ottoman military tribunals. One need only compare these events to the end of the Holocaust. I'm referencing here the Nuremberg trials and German reparations. Um, in comparison, one would need to appreciate the injustice of this treaty, this, in a sense, the injustice embedded in the peace that concluded the decades of violence in the former Ottoman lands and in, in the Caucasus. The historiography of the Armenian gen genocide has been well established um, and its temporal and spatial extent often written about. While most of the violence and the killing in the early years took place in Anatolia and the Armenian highland, which is the eastern part of what is often referred to as Anatolia, and also in the Syrian desert, the violence steadily shifted further east into the Caucasus and the lands of the former Russian Empire. This violence escalated well after the ostensible armistice of 1918, despite its requirement for the withdrawal of Turkish forces to their pre-war positions. The Turkish military constantly violated the Mudros armistice by infiltrating military agents and agitators into the Caucasus in order to instigate the Turkic Tartar people to take up the mantle of the genocide, a practice that we have now seen during the, 19, the 2020 Second Karabakh War. There is a profound ignorance on the part of the West as to the events in the Southern Caucasus in the years prior to the Bolshevik takeover of the region in December 1920. It is on the basis of this ignorance that so-called think tanks and Western media outlets simplify the Azerbaijani Turkish aggression in Karabakh, or what I will refer to often as Artsakh. Artsakh is the historical name that Armenians refer to this region. Um, Western media, and as I say, think tanks often simplify this, this conflict as just another impossible to resolve ethnic conflict rather than a continuation of the genocidal policy originally formulated by the nationalist ideologues of the Committee of Union and Progress, often referred to as the Young Turks, during the Armenian Genocide. Now, given the time constraints of this talk, I cannot review the early 20th century history of the violence perpetrated against the Armenians of the Caucasus and Karabakh. But this violence began well before 1915. It began in the 1905-1907 Armeno-Tartar massacres and continued with the 1918 invasion of the Caucasus by the Islamic army of the Caucasus. Um, it was followed by the Muslim uprisings in the summer of 1919 and the violent consequences of the betrayals first by the British and then the Soviets in 1920. The results of all these events in the early years after the First World War are a geographically precarious and resource deprived Armenian Republic, most of whose historic lands were placed outside its arbitrarily drawn borders, the chief of which uh, lands were the eastern provinces of Turkey and the formerly Russian held region of Kars, Nakhichevan, and Karabakh. 
And as we know, World War II, there were, uh, World War I, there were many arbitrarily drawn borders that have instigated conflict in the Middle East to this day. And I'm talking about Syria, Iraq, Palestine. With regard to Karabakh, most Western observers, then as now, are ignorant of its central importance to the Armen to Armenian cultural identity. Unlike many of his military colleagues in the Caucasus at the time, Colonel John C. Plowden, a member of the British mission in Yerevan, wrote the following in 1919 in response to the Turkish Azerbaijani stranglehold on the ever more beleaguered Republic of Armenia. And I think I have, uh, I don't have the quote up here. Um, I'll read it to you. Karabakh, he writes, means more to the Armenians than their religion even, being the cradle of their race and their traditional last sanctuary when their country has been invaded. It is Armenian in every particular and the strongest part of Armenia, end of quote. This leads me to the second point I'd like to raise here, the link between cultural destruction and the existential threat it poses to the Armenian people. To put it simply, cultural destruction is central to the process of genocide. I have made this argument more fully elsewhere in other publications, but it's worthy of repeating some of it here. The Azerbaijani president, Ilham Aliyev, has taken up this project of the genocide of the Armenians in the Caucasus that was left incomplete back in 1920. In many ways, this project is more insidious and sophisticated than the centuries-long campaign of Turkish genocide denial of the Ottoman era genocide of the Armenians, the Syrians, and Greeks. And the point I'm making here is that this kind of denialism has taken on a more unique form than what we, some of us are familiar with, with the Turkish official denialism of the Armenian genocide. With financial resources fueled by petroleum and gas dollars garnered from the oil industry in the Caspian, an industry, by the way, that was actually founded by Armenians before World War I, Azerbaijan has put great efforts into rewriting the history of the region. This has been made easier by the profound lack of knowledge in the West of the genocidal violence that swept the region in 1918 and the years that followed. This divorcing of past from present facilitates the lazy journalism and media we saw evidenced in the co coverage of the September 2020 Karabakh War and was exemplified by a, a number of news articles, uh, but the worst of which was by Carlotta Gall for the New York Times. Uh, the media bias of both sides, this is a conflict of, of, of equivalency um, that perpetuated this equivalence between a self-defense on the part of Armenians and the violence of the Azeri Turkish aggression against civilians is a consequence of, as I claim, this fundamental historical ignorance. Genocide scholars often note a similar phenomena where the perpetrator attempts to switch the roles with the victim. We found echoes, echoes of this in Vladimir Putin's claims at the start of the Ukraine invasion, that it was the Ukrainians who were perpetrating a genocide against the Russian speaking population of their Republic. In this perverse logic, the Armenians of Artsakh have become the perpetrators. Unfortunately, even some human rights organizations have slipped down this slippery slope, uh, and I evidenced the number of factual errors found in some of the alerts that were posted during the 2020 Karabakh War by Genocide Watch. But let me move to part two. 
Um, this is denialism, uh, genocide by other means. Azerbaijan has taken the genocidal project even further than Turkey's century long endeavors. Historical scholarship and the ever widening dispersal of knowledge regarding the Armenian genocide has limited this ignorance of, of the Armenian genocide primarily within the Turkish state and its allies. This despite millions of dollars spent on a disinformation campaign of the Turkish foreign ministry. But even though this ignorance in Turkey has been diminishing, there is still a great distance to go. Slowly beginning over 30 years ago, the Turkish academic and intellectual sphere has been uh, penetrated with knowledge regarding the Armenian genocide. Steady, publicly visible progress continued in Turkey until the summer of 2016, when a, the failed coup against the Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, ignited progressively harsh crackdowns on all aspects of civil society, including the press, academia, and now even in the arts. And this is when, soon after that, my friend Osman Kabbalah was unjustly imprisoned. In prison. I will say more toward the end of my talk regarding my experience during those years um, of progress and then regression. But yet in, in Azerbaijan, this genocidal, this project of genocidal violence that and denial has taken, uh, as I said, a more insidious twist. Layered upon the characterization of the victim as perpetrator is the attempt to erase the history of the victim group. This form of genocide denial may not be unique, but stands out from the more commonplace forms of denial. This is not a denial of the crime per se, the crime of genocide, but it's a denial of the existence of the victim group. By denying the existence of the group, the nature of the violence perpetrated against individual victims changes. It is important to recall that genocide is a crime against groups. This is what distinguishes genocide from mass murder. If there is no group, there is no genocide, just individual victims. The physical acts of violence do not disappear, and I'm not making that absurd claim, but they can be attributed to a lesser set of wrongdoings or in some cases, to no wrongdoings at all. This is central to the rhetoric of denialism that attacks the legitimacy of the victim group, reverses the identity of the victim and the perpetrator, and claims victimhood for the perpetrator. The victim groups are turned into foreigners, aliens, in the case of Armenian settler col colonists, uh, a force from without, assisted by traitors within. We saw this in the radical Hutu de delegitimizing rhetoric that characterized their fellow Tutsi Rwandans as alien foreign oppressors. This rhetoric was endemic to the radical Committee of Union and Progress, the Young Turk ideologues that perpetrated the Armenian genocide. They often labeled Ottoman Armenians as traitors whose allegiance was to their compatriots in the Russian empire and not to the Ottoman state. Ideologues from that era, from the early part of the 20th century, such as the war criminal Zia Golkop, a confidant of Mustafa Kemal, and is considered by many as the founder of Turkish nationalism, promulgated a pan-Turkism that has gained popularity in post-Soviet Azerbaijan. Erdogan, President Erdogan and President Aliyev of Azerbaijan have often espoused this philosophy of one nation, two states. 
delegitimizing group identity by erasing the history of the group facilitates this reversal. What has occurred in Azerbaijan for more than three decades is a prime example of what I am describing here and what I call genocide by other means. I will illustrate this with a few examples, but first some elaboration on the conceptual apparatus I am employing. The connections to my earlier remarks about the cultural, cultural destruction should now become clearer. My unwillingness to separate, separate out cultural destruction from genocide per se takes me back to Raphael Lemkin and the development of the concept of genocide. And I believe I have a quote from Lemkin, which I will refer to shortly. As, as has been well established, Lemkin's work on developing the concept of genocide finds its conceptual origins not in the Holocaust, but in his earlier reflections on the Armenian massacres. As uh, early as 1933, well before the codification of, of genocide into international law after the Second World War, he emphasized the collective nature of this crime. And I think this is the first quote up here from Lemkin. These are attacks carried out against an individual as a member of a collectivity. The goal of the author, the perpetrator, is not only to harm an individual, but also to cause damage to the collectivity to which the latter belongs. Offenses of this type bring harm not only to human rights, but also, and most essentially, they undermine the fundamental basis of the social order, end of quote. Such crimes against groups can take a further social dimension when culture is singled out for attack. And I have a second quote from Lemkin, in which he says, an attack targeting a collectivity can also take the form of systematic and organized destruction of the art and cultural heritage in which the unique geniuses and achievements of a collectivity are revealed in fields of science, arts, and literature." End of quote. Some would like to separate this cultural destruction from the intentional act of extermination by labeling it, as I said before, cultural genocide, or what is often referred to as heritage crimes. I, and I believe Lemkin would strongly disagree. Remember, genocide is a group crime, destroying the cultural heritage of the group and suppressing cultural production is the surest way to destroy the group. This is why I have no reservations in labeling the compulsory boarding school experience of indigenous peoples in North America as a genocidal program, which I, I believe now has been accepted by many in the field of genocide studies. Now, there is no need here to re reiterate the century long experience, evidence, I mean, of the Turkish state's destruction of Armenian cultural heritage across Anatolia and the Armenian highland. I mean, the facts are clear, and many scholars have noted this over the years. I mean, prior to the prior to 1915, there were approximately 2,300 churches and 700 schools in Turkey. Now there are 34 churches and 12 schools in Turkey. A much work on heritage recovery has been undertaken by scholars and activists. Uh, the ability to engage in this work within Turkey has become, as I said earlier, much more dif difficult with the rise of authoritarianism under President Erdogan. As the destruction, whether intentional, and of course there is natural destruction that takes place by neglect. As this accelerates, this work has become even more urgent. Yet this work of recovery now needs to expand beyond the borders of Turkey because these crimes are fully evident in the Caucasus. 
the urgency is even greater within Artsakh, within Karabakh. I would like to cite some obvious and less obvious examples of how Azerbaijan has been laying the groundwork for the historical erasure of the indigenous Armenians of this region. In the more than two decades leading up to the 2020-44 day Karabakh War, which I think some of you might vaguely recall because it was somewhat covered at that time, but uh, it's faded in the memory of many. Um, but in the, in, the, in the decades leading up to that war, there had been an ongoing and systematic campaign of erasure of Armenian cultural heritage in the regions under Azeri control, primarily Nakhichevan, which I showed you on the map, and in the Armenian populated centers of the Azerbaijani Republic. All this is well documented and increasingly publicized. Despite such documentation, however, including video evidence of the Azeri military destruction of the Julfa Cemetery. Uh, there has been no, next to no response from UNESCO and Western nations. And um, this is just summarizing what I, I just said. Uh, this is a, a slide of one of the more recent documentations of what I am describing here. Uh, as many scholars in the heritage preservation field know, there is a current ongoing threat of a similar destruction of the newly captured territories from the 2020 war. Uh, for those interested in learning more about the catastrophic consequences of the successful recent Azeri Turkish aggression and prior acts of cultural destruction, two academically based organizations have been doing outstanding work. One of them is this uh, caucus uh, is Heritage Watch, which has issued a number of, of reports. Um, and it's led by archeologists at Cornell University and Purdue University. Uh, they've established a objectively scientifically based research program called in Heritage Forensic, Forensics, that is uses satellite imagery and archival sources to objectively document the large scale destruction that has taken place and that continues today. And when I use the word objective, they issued a report about the destruction of Muslim cultural heritage in this region. And they have documented that destruction too, but the two are on opposite scales of severity. Um, and I don't know if this will work, but when I mentioned the Julfa Cemetery, this is something that uh, uh, Adam and I uh, were concerned about working on, but now there are other, uh, other groups that are working on it. This is what the, the Julfa Cemetery, this is a, a 14th century and earlier cemetery in this region of Nakhichevan which was put under uh, the Soviet Socialist Republic of Azerbaijan uh, and saw a destruction over the whole 20th century, but it accelerated uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. None of these uh, uh, Kachkars, these stone crosses exist today in this region. And I don't know if this will start when I click. Uh, yeah. This is just a, a video that was taken uh, at the time of the last destruction of the uh, Kachkar, in which Azerbaijani military uh, sledgehammered and then uh, bulldozed and dumped all of these uh, thousand year old stone crosses into, into the riverbed on the edge of this uh, site. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Now, Caucus Heritage Watch is not the only organization that's been involved in this work. Additional important work is done by Monument Watch, an independent academically based web resource that publishes reports and updates of the ongoing 
destruction and the threats to cultural heritage in, in Artsakh. While the art world has also made note of the cultural violence, the art journal, and I just have two, issue, two articles from the, from the journal called Hypo, Hyper Allergic, stands out for its extensive reporting on this matter. They have published 42 articles since 2018 about Artsakh alone, um, and they're all well worth looking at. Um, now, what I would like to explore in the second part of my, my talk are two illustrations of Israel, uh, of Azeri denialism, a denialism not of their crimes, but of the very existence of the Armenians in Artsakh and the Eastern Caucasus. Um, and the first that I, I want to look at is, is what has been noted uh, by historians as the Baku School of Historiography. And, and I, I make an analogy here to the lost cause in the United States. I don't know if you know that uh, that rewriting of history after the end of uh, slavery and the Civil War in, in, the, in the United States. Um, now, this first illustration comes out of what is known, as I say, the Baku School of Historiography, the main objective of which is to propagate a history to be employed in public school curriculum that delegitimizes the Armenian presence in the South Caucasus and in Karabakh in particular by portraying Armenians as late arrivals, settler colonists on ancestral Turkic lands. While holding no scholarly legitimacy outside of Azerbaijan, this pseudo history is pumped out in thousands of publications, not only in the Azerbaijani uh, public republic to its own citizens, but to its country's neighbors and the West. Uh, Georgian language books spreading this pseudo history and hate speech are freely distributed to libraries across Georgia, the other of the three uh, republics in the, in the Caucasus. These are distributed by the Azerbaijan Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Um, books that contain such passages as, and I, 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 I quote from one of the books, um, states that Armenians are newcomers to Turkey and the Caucasus and have found perfectly habitable lands. They have taken advantage of the hospitality of Turkic peoples and have decided to settle here for good. Nevertheless, they have not been able to rid themselves of their gypsy ways and have become the political puppets of states. Beautifully illustrated books like this one that I have up on the slide. Um, are produced in English and distributed widely in print and in electronic versions. In one example, published in print and online by the government-supported printing press, this book called Karabakh Over the Centuries, um, it erases all historical references to the Armenian presence in Karabakh. And in the chapter titled Proud Albanians, the gems of Armenian medieval religious architecture, such as the Gandazar Monastery, which is pictured here, and again here, are uh, captioned as one of the pearls of Albanian architecture. This is the claim that these monasteries were built by Caucasian Albanians, not Armenians. Now, Caucasian Albanians, you might be confused that Albanians are in the Balkans. What did they do doing in the Caucasus? Uh, but there was a period of time in from around 800 to about 11, 1200. Uh, AD, in which there was a group called the Caucasian uh, Albanians in this region. Uh, but many of them were intermixed with 
Armenians at the time, and they pretty much had disappeared, but they were a Christian minority. And then there's a whole theory that's developed around the idea that the Armenians were not Armenians, they were Albanians. Uh, any scholar would find this a little nutty, but it is what is produced constantly uh, by these sources. And now the only mention of Armenians in, in this book is a, is a chapter um, and, and this all this this Armenian cultural heritage has been appropriated into the Albanians um, is this subdued Shusha, which is Shu, it's the Armenian Azeri city of Sushi, which uh, is called uh, the sort of cultural heart of Karabakh, which is now in Azerbaijani hands. Um, but the chapter is not to forget or for, forgive, because this book was published before the last war in 2020, and this city was under Armenian control. Now it's under Azeri control. And this is the, the only reference to our Armenians is this one-sided narrative of the Armenian aggression during the first Karabakh War. And I'm not discounting that first war that took place in 1990 to 1994 <clears throat> involved human rights violations on the Armenian part as it did the Azeri part. Um, and as I said, one can find books like this. This particular book is on the shelves of public libraries and university libraries, such as Harvard in the, in the United States. The ignorance in the West is thus being fed by lies by the Azeri propaganda machine, adding fuel to the narrative of false equivalents. Typical of all authoritarian regimes, Azerbaijan engages in widespread censorship of speech in all its forms, not just political speech. Numerous writers have been arrested or exiled and their books banned and burned. Um, the chief example of a previously highly honored artist who has fallen from grace in the Alia regime is the people's writer Akram Alishli. Um, uh, he, is, uh, he was one of the most honored writers in Azerbaijan prior to his transgressing the historical narrative that has been propagated by the Alia regime. His crime was his 2013 novella, Stone Dreams, uh, which is contained in this, this translation of three of his, three of his works. Um, and in this uh, novella, which is written from the perspective of two Azeri characters who try to save their Armenian neighbors during the Sungat pogroms, there were pogroms before the Karabakh War, first Karabakh War. Um, this is his transgression for having uh, characterized these efforts of Azeris to, to save their Armenian neighbors. In the novel, a semi-comatose central character is transported in his dreams to his and the author's uh, hometown of Alis or Agulis, home to an ancient Armenian community and the historic monastery of St. Thomas, which is in this slide here and in these pictures. This is the picture of of the monastery at the beginning of the 20th century and dates from the 14th century. Um, and these are images of, that were taken actually in the mid century while the monastery still existed. And this is what it looked in, I believe in the 1970s toward the end of the, the Soviet era. This is what it looks like today. Um, it was completely demolished and in its place, this particular mosque was placed. Um, as, as I said in, in the story, the town's Armenian population um, 
in, in, in this novella is, was massacred by Azeri militias aided by Turkish officers in 1919, well before, well after the 1918 armistice. Alice Lee's benign treatment of fictional Armenian characters and his historically truthful characterization of the events led to his books being banned and burned. He himself was sent into inter internal exile, his pension revoked. So even a benign dream of a fictional character is dangerous in today's Azerbaijan. Now the, the second and uh, the last illustration of this genocide by other means that I, I want to illustrate uh, is even, I think, more insidious and is taken right out of the pages of Orwell's 1984. This involves the wholesale sanitizing of Armenian literature from before the breakup of the Soviet Union. In 2001, the Azeri government started the process of adopting the Latin alphabet, replacing the Cyrillic alphabet, which was imposed by Joseph Stalin uh, during the Soviet era. This uh, uh, Azerbaijani language was written in Cyrillic, just like the Russian language. But after independence, an effort was made to Latinize, use Latin characters for uh, the alphabet. Uh, this effort um, accelerated, and recently researchers such as Arad Serkeyan, who's a PhD student at Columbia that I, I know, has discovered that this process took on an added form under the president, current president, Ilham Aliyev's government. This opened up an opportunity for Azeri propagandists to expunge any favorable treatment of Armenians from the Azeri literary canon. The government launched a large campaign to transliterate Soviet era Azerbaijani literature from the Cyrillic Alpha into the Latin script. As, as Sir, Sir Kayan remarks, quote, during this state-sponsored campaign, more than 2,000 works of fiction have been transliterated with a particular type of censorship. Armenian characters and any kind of ethnic reference to Armenia and Armenians were cleansed from the fictional world of Soviet Azerbaijan. End of quote. Armenians disappeared from the Azerbaijani imaginary. With a clean slate to work with, the government has an easier time to indoctrinate young people with the racist stereotypes of racist stereotypes of Armenians necessary to facilitate their campaign of genocidal violence. Such stereotypes fuel the hatred that we saw manifested in the war crimes perpetrated during the war in 2020 and that continued uh, today and has also continued today during the, the blockade of Karabakh that has now reached 121 days. Young Armenian children who tried to return home to Karabakh have been erased, have been harassed, and their uh, language used against them that is racist. Uh, this is just another example of another medieval Armenian church that has disappeared uh, in a relatively short period of time uh, and is replaced by that mosque in the lower right-hand corner, which seems to be, uh, it resembles that other mosque that I, I showed you. It's, 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 it's nothing, it's in a sense a manufactured mosque. There was no community that needed a mosque there, but just as in the Balkans, what the Serbs did with mosques in tearing down mosques that they took from in areas which had the Bosnian population and they built churches, the opposite is what has been taking place here in, in, the, in the Caucasus. Um, I argue 
Um, and then and there was more I could show you for this, but I'm, I'm going to skip that here. But erasing and distorting Armenian cultural heritage, I argue, fits the types of acts outlined in the genocide convention. In the words of the convention, these are actions, quote, causing serious bodily and mental harm to members of the group and are intended to destroy the group, in this case, the indigenous Armenians of the Caucasus. Cultural destruction is, in this case, part and parcel of the genocidal process. Now, these are the ends of my, uh, my written remarks, but I want to move on uh, to show you some of the images of, uh, of the work that I and other uh, my colleagues have been doing. Um, I'm just showing here, this is uh, in a sense uh, reflective of the last point I made. This was after the 2020 war, this is President Aliyev. They, they set up a military trophy park. Uh, this was condemned in a uh, international court of justice ruling against Azerbaijan uh, because it, 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 it's, it violates what you do with the artifacts of individual soldiers who've been you know, killed in combat. But he's, they created these uh, wax images uh, of Armenian soldiers um, and um, they they use sort of uh, exaggerated facial stereotypes um, and uh, they have uh, children uh, playing in the park um, on these uh, uh, dead Armenian soldiers, wax figures of soldiers. There was such a, a, a backlash against this that this victory park was modified. That's a quote from Lindsay Snell uh, um, condemning this kind of, of action. But it all contributes to the kind of, of hatred that individuals are growing up, children are growing up with in Azerbaijan that then is reflected in, in the crimes that are committed in the violence between the, the two, two nations. But I want to move to the last part of my talk, which, as I said, I'm not going to be reading, but just talking through what I have for the images. And, and this relates to how, uh, how we and others have been trying to combat uh, denialism. Um, and and it, I quote here from Robert Bevan, um, who has written quite a bit about uh, destruction of memory during war and genocide. He writes, if the touchstones of identity are no longer there to be touched, memories fragment and dislocate, their hostile destruction is an amnesia forced upon the group as a group and on its individual constitu constituent members. Out of sight can become literally out of mind for those whose patrimony has been destroyed and for the destroyers. So it works on both. It works on the victim and the perpetrator. And, and this is what I was arguing in the first part of the talk that the, the erasure of Armenian cultural identity is, is assists those with less than benign intentions on the part of the perpetrator society, but it also has detrimental psychological effects on, on the victim society. Um, so my work in, in Turkey um, began uh, 15 years ago. And when I first started to study the situation in Turkey about denial, I was struck when I found this, the first Armenian genocide memorial in the world was actually in Istanbul, in Constantinople, uh, was this monument in the Armenian cemetery in the heart of, of uh, Istanbul, uh, or what uh, today is part of Gezi Park. This monument, of course, was built during the occupation of the city in the immediately post-war period in the First World War. It was removed and destroyed, and so was cemetery. Uh, there's something about cemeteries that, that uh, Turkish nationalism is, is uncomfortable with, uh, as we saw with the Julfa Cemetery. What you do find in many places in Turkey are these kinds of genocide memorials, 
but they are memorials that are particularly created for the purpose of changing the victim and the uh, perpetrator. Here, this is a memorial to what the Armenians did to the Turks. Uh, the monument was built for the remembrance of the Turks slaughtered in 1918 by the Armenians in this village. And of course, there was Armenian crimes committed during the time of the genocide in 1915 to 1920, 23, um, but many of them become part of this exaggerated narrative of the Turkish uh, victimhood during this period. Um, the, the progress first began soon after Haran Dink's assassination. Some of you might know about this Turkish Armenian intellectual journalist editor uh, who was assassinated in front of his newspaper office in Istanbul in 2007. And many in the Armenian diaspora were surprised at the outpouring of support for uh, Haran Dink after his assassination in the Turkish public. This is just an example of his uh, funeral uh, back in 2007. We were in a shock that Turkish citizens, not Armenians in Turkey, there are only about 60,000, uh, were identifying themselves as we are Haran, we are Armenians. Um, and there was the process that began this, this attempt to, to uh, uh, begin a, a slow reconciliation process and a discussion about the joint history of Armenians and Turks. This is a project, I'll go through these quickly, that was supported by my friend, uh, Osman Kabbalah, that started exchanges between Armenia and Turkey. Armenia and Turkey do not have uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, there were workshops, conferences, et cetera, taking place uh, that looked at history, to, in a sense, reinscribe the cultural heritage and diversity that has been erased for a hundred years in, in Turkey. There were exhibitions of photography that is an example that was uh, in, in the same uh, uh, venue where my exhibition took place. Um, this is an exhibition uh, about uh, Horvoro, which is a, a, a kind of agricultural um, song that's sung by both Armenians and Turks in, in rural areas. Um, and uh, again, this is a a photography exhibition by a French Armenian photographer. Uh, and in this exhibition, we are April 24th, as we know, this week is, is a genocide, is Holocaust Remembrance Week, but it's also for the Armenians on April 24th. Uh, a number of these have taken place. And, and this sort of captures the work I'm doing, Modern Memories Global Archival. It relies on the materiality of the trace, the immediacy of the reporting, and the visibility of the image. And I have been very privileged to uh, be the inheritor of my family's photography collection. Um, and I've used that collection in a sense to, and their stories, to give my ancestors uh, a voice, some of which that was some of which has been suppressed, some of which was, was erased over the years. Um, this, is, this is actually my words. I say that our work can be understood as a form of bearing witness, a bearing witness that symbolically asserts the moral status of the victims and their membership in the moral community by giving them and their suffering a voice. When we need that voice, we reaffirm that moral status. However, relatedly, the victim's voice they have been silenced in the past, but now there is someone who speaks for them and for all the suffering they endured. And this is what has motivated me in the work that I've done with, with NGOs in Turkey. And there are three components to it, the exhibition, the publications, and the sites of memory. Uh, and as I said, I've been privileged to have 3,000 or more photographs uh, half of them from the Ottoman period and uh, also from Turkey, uh, afterwards in Turkey, after the fall of the Ottomans, and in Greece uh, that I've been able to use 
in my work. Uh, this is an image on the right of my grandfather who started the photography business. This is his uh, one of his studios that I had. Um, these are early examples of the photography I've used in Turkey and around the world, as was mentioned. Uh, I've had exhibitions in the UK, in Greece, in Armenia, and multiple exhibitions in the United States. Um, that's the same man with the big beard, but that was when he was younger, and before he had a beard. He grew the beard because his father told him that with the beard, he would be less attractive to women. And it was dangerous taking photographs of women at that period of time. So he was concerned that he, he didn't look as handsome as he did there. So when I grew my first beard uh, in, in, in college, um, my mother had no objections to my beard. She grew up with the beard and father. My father was a um, these are some of the earliest photographs in the 1880s. My great grandfather, uh, the one on the left, is my great uncle, who also became a photographer. Uh, and and all of these uh, images, these are my great uncle, who was a photographer. He lost his way. Uh, part of part of the exhibition is telling the story, a lot of storytelling, um, because I try to individualize the people that are a statistic and. Um, I think that's the most effective way of reaching people with regard to these questions of, of, of past crimes and mass, mass atrocities. So much of it is storytelling through imagery. And we know that photographs are, are for many people, very uh, um, captivating. And there, there are hundreds of these kinds of photographs that are captivating. This is an example of my, my, my grade who go, go back. Of my uh, great uncle uh, on oops, on a, a donkey. He's the photographer. That's his equipment. He's going around the autumn the countryside. Uh, as I said, the photographs are examples of, of landscapes, not just people. This is the family's hometown. They did many of these panoramic photographs, uh, extensive photographs of, of, of cities. Uh, this photograph has actually in it um, my grandparents' home, the home that my mother was born in uh, back in 1911. Um, let's see if I can go to the next. That's the home that's taken out of another panoramic photograph. Um, so I've had exhibitions. The first one that was supported by Osman Kabbala is this, uh, this one in, in Istanbul. Um, as you can see, it was quite a large images and stories. These are the photographs. I know I've been talking for a long time, so I'm going to sort of wrap this up. Um, and I've used uh, original glass negatives in, in the exhibition. Uh, we've had school groups. This was all during the period of 2013 when there was an opening. And I was very optimistic about progress. We were getting non Armenians. Uh, Turkish students to come to the exhibition. We had different projects with, uh, with uh, younger people. We took the exhibition to different locations. Um, this is an example of uh, some of the people at the ex exhibition. Uh, there are videos that we've used in, in the exhibition. Um, we have this room that was dedicated to the victims. Um, these are all members of the family that were lost in genocide. Uh, and uh, we took the exhibition. We also, we also used videos that we created uh, that are based on interviews with members of the family. This is an example of my uh, great, this is my uncle who gave me a few in 68. We have, uh, I don't think there's an audio, the audio is missing. I know that uh, Jason was trying to get the audio to work. It's not going to work. Um, and then we we also had uh, another uh, oral history project that included this this interview in 1989. Uh, and this is an interview with my mother. Uh, we brought back to her hometown of Marisbon. She would have been amazed that you know this is the town she grew up in, and she's revisiting it in. 
in digital form. Uh, and this is the town uh, where we have the exhibition. And then uh, we work with students there. We have a similar thing in, in Diabakur. And the last exhibition was in uh, Ankara. Um, unfortunately, Diabakur has been subject to a lot of violence during the Kurdish fighting. Uh, and this was the Ankara exhibition. So I, I think I've been speaking uh, long enough. Uh, I've given separate talks about this work I do in Turkey, but as I said, all of this work came to basic end in 2016 with the coup. There was a period of time where it was uh, impossible for me to return because of the arrest of uh, Osman Kabbala, but I returned a few times. Um, and these are just images from the exhibitions I've had in other places, including the United States. Um, and my books have been published in Turkish, in translating to Turkish. But again, post 2016 coup, some of my works that were translated, the publication has been stopped. Um, so as I said, I hope in May, May 14th, the next election, things will change and there'll be an opportunity to resume some of this work in Turkey. The possibility of doing similar work in Azerbaijan is impossible because uh, clearly my life would be threatened if I ever tried to go to Azerbaijan at this point. Um, but I'll leave you with this image of my, my mother in 1915 during the height of the Armenian genocide sheltered in her home in Warsaw. So I, as I said, I've gone on for a while. I end there. I thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm open to taking a few questions. I know the evening has it's, it's gotten late. Thank you. Bert. Thank you, Dr. Subian, and you're not going anywhere quite yet. Okay. We do have some time for questions. Again, keep the microphone. Uh, we have, of course, you're exploring the digital world, and I gather that a lot of this is going to come out when you're done this year in a digital format. But yeah, this is all going to, a lot of this is being incorporated into the virtual exhibition project. So you will see the full versions of my mother's interview, my great uncle, films that have we've been made, visits to Turkey that included myself and members of the family. Uh, all of that is in the process with a team of, of, of very talented people, including my curator and my graphic digital designer, who are both Turkish. Okay, So, I mean, I've worked on these projects more with Turks than I've worked with Armenians or Americans, which, it, you know, I, I always want to emphasize because, you know, there's this, this uh, fear that you're going to be characterized as taking a nationalist view of this. And that there are people in Turkey that have taken many more risks than I have on these projects. Well, we're looking forward to the digital version. We're going to try a little bit of our own digital magic. So we're going to have some questions, um, both from our online viewers and also from our audience that came tonight. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. So I'm going to ask uh, viewers online if they have a question. Please type it into the uh, chat box, and I gather that um, Jason in the booth is going to figure out a way to make sure that either your voice or your words are, are asked. This is a test. This online. is a test. For people here, everything is picked up online on that. What I understand is a very good mic. So if you could stand up when you ask your question, um, then. Uh, I think there's a good shot that people will be able to hear it online and then Dr. McKinney will be able to answer. Please keep your questions uh, focused on uh, Dr. Subian's area of expertise and his talk, uh, and hopefully keep them fairly brief so we can get as many questions done as possible before I'm shut down uh, by the thoughts of the video. So, um, are there any questions? Now, let's start with those here. Does anybody in our audience have any questions? 
Thank you so much for the wonderful presentations. I wonder, um, you know, after the Franklin's um, assassination, was that important point for so many people, including Turkish people, who are not necessarily exposed to the real issues that are faced by you know, the Armenians in Turkey? I'm curious, and also, you know, during the Gazi Park, I was there, I remember, you know, there were better story my Kurdish and Armenian uh, friends, brothers, I saw you from the perspective of this media. It was really powerful as well. So I wonder um, whether these two events, or big events, were sort of boiling points for how people who in you know, the Armenian community in Turkey, as well as you know, Turkish people who were not again um, exposed to these real issues um, faced by you know, the uh, minorities in Turkey as a whole. Uh, yes, I mean, I think that the the, the surrounding assassination, and then also the the work that the Harambe Foundation that was set up soon after started to do uh, opened up the issue of the hidden army, and it, and it, it, and uh, the the terminology hidden army refers to uh, Turkish citizens, Turkish and Kurdish, uh, who discovered that their grandmothers were Armenian. Many Armenian survivors were uh, taken by both Kurds and Turks, some of them uh, more for benign reasons than others for more uh, evil reasons. Um, and they became Islamicized, though many of them uh, still tried to maintain their Armenian identity. Uh, and and I have to add a footnote. My family survived in 1915 in part because of the topography, because my grandfather was needed by the Ottoman army. But the whole family had to convert to Islam for the duration of the war. Uh, and then at the end of the war, they converted back to Christianity. The war they took back their Ar Armenian identity. So. Many people in this uh, period after the Davis assassination started to realize that there was a history here, and some of it was very personal. And stories started coming out about my grandmother. There was the famous Petit, uh, 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 the Turkish human rights lawyer, whose grandmother uh, was was uh, Armenian. Um, and then Gezi Park opened that up even to other issues, not just the Armenian issue, but the whole kind of uh, question of suppression of Kurdish identity, uh, ecological reasons. I was in Istanbul at the time of the Gezi Park demonstrations. Uh, I experienced the, the tear gas, but I also experienced the euphoria that was uh, evident in, in young people coming out to try to defend the green space. And so all of that, I think, uh, began a process, but it also sowed the seeds of the repression that eventually took hold. Uh, Osman Kavala was con convicted for the work, the claim that he and George Soros provided funds for this Gezi Park demonstration rebellion uh, to overthrow the Turkish, Turkish government. Um, so that thing, that opening that began in 2007, started to show cracks in 2013, 2014, 2015, and then with the uh, end of the ceasefire with the PKK in, in 2016, and the election that put Erdogan into a stronger hold in the rewriting of the Constitution, that all started the process of, of a setback, and that's what we're still experiencing today. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much, Professor, for <clears throat> this uh, very powerful and engaging talk. <clears throat> uh, actually, I am also a survivor of genocide um, in Sri Lanka, and from Sri Lanka, I am a Tamil. And I, I observed that there are lots of parallels between it's, the Tamils like and, and Armenian. I would <clears throat> like you to say a few words about whether you have any kind of comparative studies or comparative examples 
uh, of this Armenian genocide and the uh, genocide by attrition and uh, and the continuation of genocide by other means in uh, other situations in other geographic areas. Oh, okay, I I, I I just caught the end of it, but uh, I think you're you're asking how this is been evidenced in, in other other areas. And and I, I I think you can find examples and I made some slight references to it in in in, in my talk. Uh, I mean one one can think of the process of forced assimilation um, in which you're erasing the culture of an indigenous people. Um, as similar to what I, I'm claiming here, uh, but it, it, it's not quite that extreme because it was never claimed in the United States or in Canada that Native Americans didn't exist, but the idea was to erase their culture. And by erasing their culture, the group disappeared. And that's why it's considered, I, I would think, fits into this idea of a group crime um, and fits the definition of, of uh, genocide. We find that uh, there are variations on this, but I mean, certainly there are claims that have been made with regard to Tibetans, uh, with regard to the, the People's Republic of China, uh, of the, the kind of attempt to uh, distort and, and uh, erase part of that culture. And we have, of course, what's going on with the Uyghurs, the Muslim minorities in in, uh, in China. Uh, there, there, you know, there are forms of this also with the Rohingya uh, as being characterized as foreigners and not not native to Myanmar. Uh, these are all examples of similar uh, attempts of erasure of the culture of the people. Um, but I, I, I think in the case of rewriting the history in the sophisticated way it's taking place in Azerbaijan, as I would claim, uh, it has its unique characteristics. I mean, all of these, all of these genocides and genocidal processes have something unique about each of them. And I thought what was unique about the, the one with regard to Azerbaijan is, is erasing the presence of Armenians in fictional literature. In a sense, that's why I call it an Orwellian attempt. Here, you, you're going to take, you're going to remove them the history of the region, and whatever artifacts you leave in the region will be called Caucasian Albanian and not Armenians. Um, so I, I think you can legitimately see similarities in a number of things. I hope that answers some of your questions. Thank you. We have uh, any questions from people here in person? If I may, uh, and I'm, honestly, I don't know how to ask what I want to ask, but you're uh, telling someone to try to oversimplify this, to ask with the overwhelming um, impetus of the force in terms of what has been accomplished in a very bad way over time. What is it you can really do to, to enforce that or stop that? And think back in history where you have, you know, what took place in 1914 to, you know, future time. Thinking back in terms of how much has been reported about the Armenian genocide, you know, I've had maybe three reports in the last 15 years that I can say occurred in a general public sense. It's very little. You know, the famous quote by another person who committed a large amount of genocide himself was in 1933, I believe, the comment was, who here remembers the immediate genocide, giving credence to what he was about to accomplish, and that's Adolf Hitler. But in, in that gravity of, of mindset, what is it you are wanting to accomplish, or uh, to accomplish, but what is the end goal in which you could achieve something of satisfaction that would be ending this in that way. And I'm not sure if I can really formulate that. 
Yeah, I think I, I, I get your point, and I think it, it's it's reflected in not just my work, but in others in trying to bring this to the attention of a more general public. Um, and you know, the fact it's been very frustrating in the United States that we continue to in, in provide security assistance to the Republic of Azerbaijan. And we've ruled out any sanctions of the Republic. So we, uh, we and others who want to make this a more public issue have to work with, with governments to put this on, on their radar, which it isn't for many, many cases. Um, you know, your, your quote about Hitler was 1939 before the invasion of, of Poland. Um, and we know what uh, the years prior to that uh, of, of in, in the sense, not taking seriously what Hitler was up to in the years after 1933, what that led to. Uh, we, we have to take as seriously these kinds of events, and I'm not just talking about what's happening in Armenia and Karabakh, but other kinds of potential mass atrocities. Uh, and uh, there has been some movement. The International Court of Justice has had two uh, rulings against Azerbaijan, but against, but there's no um, enforcement mechanism for any of those. So, I don't want to get into the legal aspects of international law, but uh, we, we need to strengthen these in institutions of, of international law. You know, I'm, I'm, I try to be hopeful. I try to be optimistic, but there are many times where I'm, I'm deeply pessimistic that something, something can be done. Uh, but as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep trying uh, to present these issues in as many forms as I have an opportunity to, to present. Uh, and uh, I, I like to say also one of my best forms is in the classes I teach. So I think it's a role, my role as an educator to reach young people. And we, we, see, we see the same, uh, you know, frustrations when it comes to climate change but how now people are much more serious about tackling that, that issue. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I, I, I hope that my work and the work of others in Turkey will result in some political change. And I'm hoping in, in May, May 14th that will take place for as much uh, for the, the Kurds in that country, as for the uh, Armenians and the Armenians in the diaspora. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morsubian. It's an honor for me also to join your lecture and listen to you today. Please allow me to thank you and convey our appreciation on behalf of the Peace and Conflict Studies family, students, professors, PACS directors, staff members, and also our siblings and friends from Moro Institute and the St. Paul's College. We would like to thank you for making time to visit us here in Winnipeg, and not only visiting the University of Manitoba, you took the time to visit the Holocaust Education Center and also Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And the most important for us as the students from the Peace and Conflict Studies, you attended our colloquium. It was an honor for us to have you listen to our presentation and most importantly we appreciate uh, all the uh, encouraging comments and thoughts that advice that you provided to me and my classmates as well and today this lecture also was a special your lecture not only shed a light on the historical events surrounding the genocide but also provided the perspective on its ongoing impact on the armenian communities today your passionate delivery and unwavering commitment to educate the public and as from the peace and conflict studies is important topic and has inspired all of us. 
thank you once again for being uh, here and to join us here uh, at Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Manitoba. We were honored to be listeners and to attend your lecture and for you to come here as the guest uh, speaker. We look forward to uh, future collaboration and look forward for your support. Now I would like to ask my colleagues uh, and friends to present our token of appreciation. Thank you again for coming and visiting us, Dr. Marsibian. Thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words. And uh, please, any of your uh, doctoral students, uh, you have my email address. I would love to hear and read about some more of your work in the future and follow your career. Thank you so much for being here.